Today we will learn and reflect on the fascist Franco regime during the Spanish Civil War. Unlike Christians living under the fascist regimes of Italy and France, in the more hardcore Nazi regime of Nazi Germany, the Catholics of fascist Spain faced few moral dilemmas when supporting the Franco fascist nationalist party since the opposing communist republicans martyred clergy by the thousands. These atrocities, along with the millions martyred for their beliefs by the Bolsheviks in the Russian Revolution, meant that for Christians before and during World War II, communism was the mortal enemy of the Christian faith, which meant that many European Christians saw fascists as allies in their struggles against communism. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video and my blogs that also cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Now we have videos on why many Catholics and Protestants supported fascist regimes in Mussolini's Italy and Vichy France in the World War II era and before and how also many German Christians either supported or tacitly tolerated the Nazi regime, enabling and tolerating Hitler's rise to power and the Nazi German nationalism during his dictatorship. These historical inquiries always lead back to the Spanish Civil War fought between 1936 and 1939 before the outbreak of World War II, where the communists persecuted the Catholic Church systematically murdering many priests, monks, and nuns in the regions they controlled. This happened before, after Lenin overthrew the Tsar's government in the Russian Revolution, the communists martyred millions of Christians as a matter of state policy. By far, there have been more Christian martyrs in the 20th century in communist Russia than in the prior 19th centuries combined in all countries. The Pope and many Catholics were very willing to give the fascists and Nazi parties the benefit of the doubt because the fascists were the enemies of the godless communists who martyred Christians. Although Hitler was the enemy of both Catholics and Protestants, the fascist regimes of Italy, Spain, and Vichy France openly supported the Catholic policies in their countries. We shall investigate primarily the history of Catholicism in the Spanish Civil War as, as reported by one of the leading histories of the period, the Battle for Spain by Antony Beaver. The Spanish Civil War also has many other excellent histories available and has also spawned literary works including Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bells Toll and George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. First, we need to understand the unique history of Catholicism in Spain in the centuries leading up to the Civil War. The Spanish crown was always a stalwart champion of Catholicism. Spanish Catholicism profoundly influenced medieval Catholicism both for better and worse, both for Spain and Catholicism. Spain was the only Western European region that fell to the Muslim armies. The Reconquista struggle to defeat the Muslims, which ended in 1492, had lasted for seven centuries. This unique struggle helps explain why Spain is unique. Although this was a long and complicated process, often slowed by alliances between local Christian and Muslim rulers, the Reconquista meant that the Spanish nobles were weaker and the monarchy was stronger than in other European nations. Also, there were closer ties historically between the Spanish armies and the Catholic Church, which persisted into the age of Spanish colonialism. Since the Reconquista ended shortly before Luther was born, Spain was less affected by the Protestant Reformation than the other Western European Spanish countries. Spain was economically backward. The Spanish colonial system was more exploitive and less concerned with trade than any other European countries. The vast amounts of gold and silver mined in Mexico and Peru and the Catholic prejudice against usury also helped to hinder the development of a Spanish merchant class. Spain was much slower to abandon feudalism in a system where nobles were not only not expected to work, they were mocked if they did do any productive work. In contrast, the peasant serfs paid both the taxes and performed the back-breaking agricultural tasks to feed the country while living lives of destitution and sometimes near starvation. The period joke was that half of Spain eats but does not work, while the other half works but does not eat. 
The mountains of the Pyrenees helped to isolate Spain from the rest of Europe, but this did not prevent Napoleon from invading Spain and infecting Spanish society with the liberal ideas of the French Enlightenment and the legal egalitarian legal principles of the Napoleonic Code. Under Enlightenment philosophy, the development of liberalism led to anti-clerical sentiments in the small but growing middle class, particularly in the reign of a very capable King Charles III half a century after Napoleon. In the decades after King Charles III, Spain was less stable politically. Between 1814 and 1875, there were 37 attempted military coups, out of which about a dozen were successful. In 1873, the Spanish monarch abdicated shortly before the short-lived First Spanish Republic, and the House of Savoy were the constitutional monarchs from 1874 to 1931, which was shortly before the Spanish Civil War. This trinity of army, monarchy, and Catholic Church presided over both the Spanish Empire and its final collapse after the Spanish-American War of 1898, when the young American nation humiliated the Spanish forces in Cuba and the Philippines, causing Spain to cede both the Philippines and Puerto Rico to the United States. Since Spain took longer to evolve away from a feudal agricultural society than the rest of Europe, it was less prosperous and more backward than its neighbors. Spain was so impoverished that half a million Spaniards, from a total population of 18 million, emigrated to their former colonies in the New World. Two-thirds of Spanish citizens were illiterate agricultural peasants. The church and the landlord class worked together to keep the peasants impoverished. The ballot box and the judicial system were rigged to deny justice to the peasant class. Just as in France, the church was not monolithic, so in Spain, the local village priest was just as impoverished as his peasant parishioners and was more sympathetic to their plight than his superiors. Since Spain was neutral in World War I, these war years and post-war years were a welcome period of prosperity for all of Spain due to the rising agricultural, raw material, and industrial exports. And again, we have another painting of a lavish royal wedding that illustrates the growing chasm between the very wealthy and the very, very poor peasant class. And that leads us to the Second Spanish Republic. Although the Great Depression did not affect Spain as much as more developed countries, it did lead to a dramatic fall in exports and economic hardships. The monarchy was tied too closely to the military dictatorship, and King Alfonso XIII abdicated in 1931, soon after the Republicans won the municipal elections of that year. And what was first supposed to be municipal elections in 1931 were interpreted by the people as a plebiscite. And since the Republican candidacies gained the majority, the city councils declared that this was now the Second Spanish Republic. Although only at the time 5 to 20 percent of Spain's population attended Catholic Mass, this anti-clericalism in this Second Spanish Republic was deeply resented by the traditional Catholic clergy and believers and landowners and the conservative members of the army. And this set the stage for the start of the Spanish Civil War. The terminology is a little confusing. The Republicans have a far different meaning in the Spanish Civil War than it does in American politics. In the Spanish Civil War, the Republicans were the Socialists and the Communists. And there was a Civil War within the Civil War where the Communists took over the movement and, in the process, killing many Socialists. The rebelling Nationalists were the Fascist General Franco and the rebelling fascist generals. And I might add, Franco never persecuted the Jews in Spain and even discreetly harbored Jews escaping to Spain during World War II. And just a quick overview of the Spanish Civil War, which lasted from 1936 to 1939. In early 1934, the Socialist Executive Committee pushed a program to nationalize all land, dissolve religious orders, and seize their property, and dissolve the army replacing it with a national militia. These proposals strengthened the Bolshevik party over the other socialist parties, and the relations between the Bolsheviks and the socialists became so bad that the Bolsheviks executed many of the socialists. Just before the start of the Spanish Civil War, Largo Caballero, a leading socialist and prime minister of Spain, sowed discord when he started encouraging a violent overthrow of the social order by the vanguard of the proletariat, 
and shouting communist mantras while condemning the fascist wolf, which led to a self-fulfilling prophecy when general strikes, sometimes coupled with armed revolt, were staged in several regions of Spain. The government was forced to declare a state of war against the armed workers. Historians estimate that between 15,000 and 30,000 workers participated in these violent uprisings that also took the lives of about 40 priests and the wealthy. Compromise in the 1930s was impossible between the far-left communists and socialists who shouted for violent revolution and the army and civil guard who cruelly repressed their protests and rebellions. This guaranteed that the last elections in Franco's lifetime were held in 1936. The nationalists refused to support a government that would not protect the interests of the Catholic Church. Although the leftist parties won this election by a small margin, they acted as if they were handed an electoral mandate for revolutionary change. The Falange Española, also known in English as the Spanish Falnex, or the Spanish Fascist Party, was born in a Madrid meeting in 1933 that attracted student, fascist intellectuals, and conservatives from the wealthy and middle class, which were threatened by the radical leftists. The Falange was deeply conservative, supporting the church and the army and the historical traditions of Spain. Like their fascist counterparts, they were eager to battle their leftist enemies in street fighting. Some thought the ideal Falangist was half monk, half soldier, like modern Reconquistas. In hindsight, the Republicans were doomed to lose the Civil War. The great Stalinist purge trials that decimated the officer corps and political and bureaucratic class of Russia occurred at the same time in history. Being a lackey of Stalin was valued far more highly than professional competence. This attitude only intensified the inflexible ideology of the far left in the Spanish Civil War. Battles were valued more for their propaganda victories than their actual military worth. Strategic retreats were ideologically suspect. Once you committed troops to a battle, you never retreated. You just kept committing more troops until your armies were either victorious or they were all dead or captured. And after all battles, the dead always leave their guns and trucks and tanks behind. So they always had supply problems. The Republicans always had fewer and older guns and tanks and trucks than the Nationalists. Stalin was always stingy and often did not live up to his commitments to supply the Republican armies. And this stinginess only increased as the Bolshevik intimidation of the more moderate socialist parties increased. Early in the war, the Republicans made the mistake of depositing the government gold reserves in Moscow. Stalin was quick to oblige, but would never account for these gold reserve deposits. Stalin gained propaganda victories by simply promising aids, and the Western Democratic allies were neutral, refusing military aid to both sides. The policy of the English Prime Minister at the time, Nelson Chamberlain, was to appease the Nazis. In contrast, the Germans and Italians were eager to test and supply weapons to their fascist friend Franco, as Spain potentially had great strategic importance. Uh, the German Luftwaffe pilots were eager to try out their blitzkrieg bombing tactics, while the Russian pilots were far more timid and less willing to risk defeat, preferring patrols to aggressive combat. Unlike the later Cold War conflicts, in the Spanish Civil War there were very few Spanish pilots. And we have a picture of the Condor Legion from Germany. Uh, the Legion is known for its war crimes, especially by the Luftwaffe, which bombed innocent civilians at Guernica, but Franco could not have won the war without them. Both sides in the Spanish Civil War were guilty of committing civilian and military massacres. But what frightened the Pope and Catholics all over Europe was that the Republicans targeted specifically priests and monks and nuns for massacres by the thousands and sometimes brutal tortures. Since the Nationalists were the friends of the Church, they tended to only massacre the priests who served either as chaplains or soldiers in the Republican armies although sometimes priests that were simply suspected of firing on nationalist troops were also executed. Instead, the nationalists decided that they would massacre liberal school teachers. Sometimes the public executions were public events. And also the German Luftwaffe pilots practicing their new Blitzkrieg bombing strategies. In the infamous bombing of Guernica, the German pilots first destroyed a church and then circled back for target practice on those who were fleeing from the church. 
In the years immediately after the war, Franco continued his massacres of Republicans. Although the Luftwaffe blitzkrieg bombing campaigns of the Spanish Civil War definitely served as practice for the dive bombing tactics in the Nazi invasions of Poland and France, the Spanish Civil War was really more like the brutal battle of Stalingrad. In both of these conflicts, both sides stubbornly fought viciously for a propaganda victory, never willing to strategically retreat, readily accepting massive military and civilian casualties. The fascist nationalists always had a manpower advantage. They started the war with 40,000 battle-hardened troops from Morocco and some 60,000 greener troops from Spain, but in time the Republicans were able to recruit armies whose lack of experience was often overcome by ideological enthusiasm. Enthusiasm which faded as the fatalities of war mounted. By late 1937, both sides had between 650,000 and 700,000 troops each. The most competent nationalist general was Francisco Franco, although he was quite conservative in his strategic decisions. Now, many historians speculate that Franco's battlefield caution was purposeful. The more numerous were the casualties of war, the fewer were his political opponents after the war. In this civil war, the plotting McClellans were always preferred over the decisive Grants. And the civil war grinds on and on and on. Most military coups are quick. Either they succeed in a week or two or they fail. The Spanish Civil War is an outlier. It is the military coup that lasted four bloody years. The coup quickly succeeded in some conservative regions, but drug on in Republican regions, including the key capital of Spain, Madrid. Although the nationalist fascists quickly won over regions bordering Madrid, Madrid itself would not surrender until the dying days of the war. This was a coup that was attempted in the various regions of Spain by multiple generals. Although most of the Spanish generals and officers were Falange sympathizers, there were some generals loyal to the Republican government, and some generals were socialists and some generals sided with the socialists due to local political reasons and the initial failure of the Falangist coup in their region. Just as there was general anticipation of the initial communist uprising, likewise many also anticipated the nationalist Falange uprising. There was just too many people and too much publicity involved to keep these political events secret. This was also the first coup in history where the military tried to quickly seize the radio stations and telephone exchanges and airports in the very beginning of the war. The Falange generals did not anticipate the determination of the Union members and many members of the Civil Guard to oppose the coup. Often Nationalist soldiers were attacked with unexpected furor with homemade weapons and bombs and snipers. The coup was successful in Seville near Madrid, but there was unexpected resistance in Barcelona since the Unionist movement was strong in the surrounding regions of Catalonia. In his book, Anthony Beaver provides more details on the suffering and atrocities on both sides in chapters titled Red Terror, White Terror, and the Nationalist Zone, and the Republican Zone, if you want more gory details of the daily back-and-forth struggle of the war. But we'll instead just show you the broad outline of the war. The maps in Wikipedia show that the Nationalists started the war in 1937, controlling more of the territory in the north and west of Spain, which bordered the Portugal and the Atlantic, and the Republicans controlled Madrid and central and eastern Spain, bordering the Mediterranean Sea, and also a strip of land along the Atlantic Ocean that were in the Basque areas in the north. The maps illustrated the slow, slogging campaigns of the war. In 1938, the Republican regions were cut in two when the Nationalists captured a large corridor to the Mediterranean Sea. In 1939, the small Republican Catalonian pocket was captured, while the bulk of the Republican-held territories did not collapse until the very end of the war, and this included the central capital city of Spain, which was Madrid. The estimates of total casualties range from 250,000 to 2 million. Most historians agree they exceeded definitely a million lives. The Spanish Republicans were the winners in the arena of public opinion and the liberal international press. Early in the war, many idealistic young socialists flocked to join the International Brigade to battle the fascists. During the war, over 30,000 foreigners from over 50 countries volunteered to serve in these brigades. 
and most of the foreign press reported from Republican territory. Many foreign socialists, like George Orwell, became disillusioned by the murderous Bolsheviks who struggled to increase their control over all the socialist parties. Orwell came to fear that he was much more likely to be shot by the communist conspirators than enemy fascist soldiers. When these volunteers tried to return home, they sometimes found that they were not allowed to leave, and were sometimes forced to fight senseless bloodletting battles at the point of a pistol. Sometimes socialists who refused to join the Communist Party were shot. If foreign volunteers were foolish enough to surrender their passports, the passports were often sent to Moscow in diplomatic pouches so Soviet NKVD agents could steal their identity. If the foreign volunteers did manage to escape to their home countries, they were often blacklisted by left-wing publishers if they dared to criticize the Bolsheviks. Finally, total victory in the founding of the totalitarian Catholic state. In the beginning of the Civil War, Franco's constitutional formula was to establish a monarchy without a monarch, with Franco as the ruling strongman. This avoided both the unpopularity of the deposed King Alphonse and avoided establishing a monarchy that could later depose Franco, as King Victor Emmanuel would later depose Mussolini when Sicily was invaded. In the Spanish Civil War, General Franco sought the total destruction of his enemies, the transformation of Spain, turning it back to its traditional Catholic values, and the establishment of a totalitarian regime. When eventual victory became certain in early 1938, Franco formalized the structure of his totalitarian government. Unlike Nazi Germany, uh, government ministers were bound to swear allegiance to the head of state rather than to Franco personally. In Franco's government, the key ministries of defense, public order, and foreign affairs were all controlled by generals. Abolished were the liberties of meeting and public association. The ministries of justice and education were mandated to reverse all Republican legislation related to church affairs and education. Crucifixes would once again hang in every Spanish classroom. The new law of the press forbade the press from criticizing the government or the prestige of the nation. The official language would be Castilian, but Basque and Catalan could no longer be spoken in public. Also abolished was the pretense of class struggle. This was replaced by a government-sponsored association of bosses and workers. Surprisingly, the Fuero del Trabajo, or the Right of Work Decree, combined both Falange political doctrines with the progressive pro-labor papal encyclical Rerum Novarum. This encyclical was the start of the Catholic doctrine of social justice, which would also influence the formulation of FDR's New Deal policies. The Republicans had foolishly trusted the Spanish foreign reserves to Stalin's regime, so Franco was forced to mortgage the country's mineral wealth to pay Germany for its military aid during the war. Hitler was the stricter creditor. Mussolini let Franco slide on his Italian war debts. And the Spanish Civil War finally ends. And when it ended, the economy was in ruins. There was massive destruction of railways, roads, bridges, ports, power lines, and telephone systems. Half a million buildings were either destroyed or severely damaged. One of the nation's first priorities was returning farms and land seized by Republican forces during the war and in reversing the agrarian reforms of the Spanish Republic. Both wages and prices were fixed and controlled by the state, strikes were outlawed, and the business profits of owners were limited. Prison camps were established all over the country, holding close to half a million former Republicans although executions, suicides, and escapes reduced these totals. Although conditions were quite brutal in the prisons and prison camps, my sources suggest that the camp conditions uh, did not approach those in the more brutal Nazi death and labor camps in Germany and in the Third Reich. These prisoners were available to assist in rebuilding the infrastructure destroyed by the war. Only after the end of World War II would Franco pardon the political prisoners of the Spanish Civil War. Ominously, in 1943, over 12,000 children were forcibly kidnapped from their Republican mothers and handed to Catholic orphanages for adoption by more politically correct couples. The military dictators of Argentina would copy this practice 30 years later. Republicans were purged from the schools and universities and were obliged to submit to the authority of the church and the new state. 
Neighbors were encouraged to spy on the neighbors. Continued vigilance for approved ideology was considered to be patriotic. Women were encouraged to work at home to tend to housework and always be obedient to their husbands. Marxism, the Enlightenment, and Freemasonry had been defeated by the virtuous fascist forces of the Falange. And Franco was no fool. He declared Spanish neutrality in World War II. When Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, Franco was quick to declare Spain as a neutral country in the upcoming conflict. The Spanish Civil War had ended only a few months before. Spain was in no condition to fight in another war so, so soon. After the fall of France, Franco decided to hedge his bets. Rather than being a neutral nation, Spain would now be a non-belligerent nation. And Franco offered to assist Hitler if Spain's assistance was needed. Hitler decided to take up Franco on his offer, so Franco offered to enter the war on the Axis side. In return, Spain only needed uh, some generous supplies of arms and fuel and ammunition and food and Morocco and Iran and a large portion of the Sahara and also some French colonies in Africa, including Guinea. Hitler saw Franco as a hard bargainer, so he decided he would have a personal meeting with Franco on the French border. Hitler wanted to seize the strategic British outpost of Gibraltar that guarded the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea, but Franco worried that the British would then seize the Spanish Canary Islands. Afterwards, the Franco government sent a detailed list of the military supplies needed if Spain were to enter the war. The wish list of military supplies that Franco requested exceeded the supply capacity of Germany. Hitler confided to Mussolini that he would rather have four of my teeth pulled rather than have to talk to that man Franco again. Hitler needed Franco's cooperation to seize Gibraltar, but that cooperation was not forthcoming. Now, Gibraltar is really a small peninsula with a huge mountain called the Rock of Gibraltar. The British could squeeze in only two airplane runways running crosswise after they filled in part of the bay. And you can see the runways on the far side of this photo if you look closely. Uh, the sole runway also intersects the only road leading into Gibraltar from Spain, which is used by the Spaniards working in Gibraltar, so the traffic needs to be stopped while the planes are landing. Canary Islands are both strategic and they're also famous for their volcanoes, including the one on the western La Palma Island that has a weak flank that some scientists may worry might slide into the ocean during a volcanic eruption, which in turn may create a tsunami a hundred feet high that might submerge every major city in the North Atlantic Ocean, and hopefully in that case the Statue of Liberty will not need to hold her breath. And now we will talk about the sources we used for this video. There are many excellent books on the Spanish Civil War. I chose this one by Anthony Beaver, The Battle for Spain, and it is a fun read. And he has many chapters on the actual war itself that we didn't cover since it was just a slogging war. I plan to read the famous accounts written about the Spanish Civil War by two authors who fought with the Socialists on the Republican side of the war. George Orwell wrote The Homage to Catalonia and his deep disillusionment about communism as a result of his experience in the war led him to write the books Animal Farm and 1984. And also, Ernest Hemingway wrote a book on the Spanish Civil War titled For Whom the Bell Tolls. An interesting question remains, did the fascist Falange totalitarian support of the Catholic Church damaged the reputation of the Church in the long run. This is an interesting question examined by history of the Catholic Church in Spain from the monarchy through the entire modern era by Stanley Pope, Spanish Catholicism and Historical Review. So I plan to make this interesting history a topic of a future video. And we have other videos, some of which tie American history to the European history during World War II. Victor Frankl's message in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, is that no matter what challenges life throws at you, even the challenges of the Nazi concentration war camps, you can find the strength to persevere if your life has meaning. The Stoicism of Nelson Mandela in South Africa, who went from prison to the presidency, who was in prison for challenging apartheid, shows how we can persevere and defeat racial hatred in our lives and society. Many people are unaware that the Nazis used the Jim Crow race laws as precedents when drafting their anti-Semitic race laws that started the persecution of the Jews by the state bureaucracy. And finally, the spiritual danger of white evangelical Christian nationalism is that it can too easily morph into all-out white supremacy. 
We challenge our white Christian listeners to sample our videos on civil rights so you can be more compassionate towards the plight of our black brothers in Christ. Frederick Douglass belongs to the first generation of black leaders. He escaped from slavery and became a leading abolitionist orator before the Civil War and became a leading civil rights leader during the Reconstruction years after the Civil War. Booker T. Washington was a teenager when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves in the Deep South. And he was both an orator and a second generation black leader who focused on educating the freed slaves so they could improve themselves. W.E.B. Du Bois was born during Reconstruction and was an orator writer and was a third generation activist black leader who, fa who helped found the NAACP. Father Augustine Talton, like Booker T. Washington, was emancipated during the Civil War. He was invited to study in Rome for the priesthood, and he was the first former slave who was ordained a priest, despite the fact that when he was emancipated, he was totally illiterate. The YouTube description links to the video script in our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends, and by clicking the like and subscribe buttons, and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, and please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos and other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.